Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Collier. How are you all? I hope you're home relaxing while I, while I give this talk. <laughs> I'd like to be there too. So I'm going to try to make this kind of a fun learning experience for everybody. Uh, basically, I, I got a pretty general <clears throat> uh, title, Common Causes of Spine Pain. And um, I'd like to make it more of an educational experience for most people so they can get a better understanding of uh, anatomy, what I look for when I'm seeing patients, and uh, different things to watch out for if there are problems with uh, red flags, things that could be potentially uh, dangerous. So we'll touch on all these points, and um, I'm grateful that everyone's uh, signing, uh, watching today and sending in their questions. Feel free to send any questions you have as it goes along. And uh, I have a lot of slides, so it might get a little boring, so I'll try to try to jazz it up a little bit at times. Uh, just freewheeling it here, so uh, let's see. What we let's get started. So basically, a little background for me: um, I, I'm an interventional spine specialist here at uh, Southeast Orthopedic Specialists. I did my medical training at Georgetown University. Prior to that, I had uh, training in physiology and biophysics, a master's degree. Uh, residency was at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center. Uh, there, I had both pain and interventional training, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital and Hospital for Special Surgery. I've been in practice for about 25 years or more now, and um, I'm board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the common causes of lower back pain. Um, uh, basically, uh, there are several different causes of lower back pain. Some of the most common that I see are trauma related. It can be due to a motor vehicle accident. It could be due to a slip and fall, a uh, athletic injury, or just uh, the common slips and falls that may occur around the house. Um, arthritis is a secondary problem that can uh, develop and be problematic. It's more of an indolent problem. It kind of creeps up on you. It's a chronic uh, condition that uh, occurs. Genetic deformities, these uh, may not show up at a young age, but as you age and uh, degenerative changes set into the spine, degenerative, uh, congenital deformities can contribute to chronic problems like scoliosis or leg length discrepancies and as such. Um, I did add less common causes of back pain uh, because we really have to look for red flags and I just wanted to bring that up. Aneurysms, cancer, infections, Aneurysms, Tom, uh, is it uh, Tom Ritter at the Threes Company? He had back pain and they misdiagnosed him and he had an aneurysm at first and he died. So these are things we need to look at. Uh, we always keep in consider, keep this in on the back of my mind, my mind when I'm doing evaluation anyway. Cancer is another uh, cause of indolent back pain. It's really important for us to do a very thorough history and physical to make sure there's no uh, increased risk for cancers and we need to uh, evaluate that. Infections. Uh, abscesses, things like that can, uh, are, uh, can occur and can cause significant back pain and leg pain and mimic typical back pain as well. And um, uh, patients with uh, rheumatic heart disease, if they had scarlet fever years ago, can develop vegetations on their heart valves where little bits of infections uh, or little bacterial infections can spread through the blood and, and uh, go into the area called Babson's plexus of the spine and cause infections in that area. So we need to keep that in mind so that, that if a patient had scarlet fever and they could develop back pain, then I would think, hey, that, that's something we may consider. We'll ask if they have fevers or chills, and, and we might do sp uh, specialized lab work and uh, radiologic imaging for that. So uh, it's important for us to uh, consider all of these things, doing a thorough history and physical to get started. So this is a little cartoon here. A doctor says you'll be out of here and back on the sofa in no time. Uh, one of the major causes of lower back pain is inactivity. And uh, losing muscle strength and core stabilization, our core strength is one of the leading causes of that. And that can be occupational at, uh, hazard as well. Uh, so today I'm gonna discuss diagnosis and treating the spine pain. I think initially we should go over anatomy. So understanding some general anatomical structures, I think is really important for us to get a good understanding of some of the things I'm gonna talk about today. So um, here we see part of the, I would say the upper lumbar area because we still have some of the spinal cord there. Uh, the spinal cord uh, comes down through 
uh, off, your, off your brain and down through the spinal canal and extends through the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and ends just at the upper lumbar uh, spine into the, uh, the ending of the conus medullaris and the terminale, uh, uh, phylum terminale, which is a little cord that goes all the way down to the tailbone. And you see on the right side of the screen uh, that we have seven cervical vertebrae, eight cervical nerve roots, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Those 12 thoracic vertebrae are attached to the ribs and is a fairly stable structure. Later in life, if you have osteoporosis, osteopenia, that's the most common area to have compression fractures. Uh, the lumbar spine is also an area that we have a lot of trauma that we uh, treat quite a bit. Disc herniations that are most common are L4-5 and L5-S1 in the lower part of that lumbar area where more, most of the weight and stress occur. And there are five lumbar vertebrae. And in the sacrum, there are fused vertebrae, and there are five of those. In the coccyx, so the tailbone area, there are four unfused vertebrae, and there are your tailbone. They're soft structures, really uh, just have ligament connections and uh, can cause problems as well. Coccydinia is a very common problem with uh, coccyx pain. Um, in terms of the, the sacrum, you can have deformities of the sacrum. You can have a transitional vertebrae where instead of having five fused vertebrae, one of the vertebrae may not be fused and we may have something called a lumbarized or a lumbarized sacral vertebrae. So that you can have transitional segments and uh, that's getting into a lot of detail. But some of the general anatomy we see on the left side, we see the spinal cord and spinal canal. From the spinal cord, you see nerve roots, both the ventral and dorsal ramus of the uh, nerve roots come out of the spinal cord and then coalesce into the main nerve trunk. Uh, the cell bodies for the uh, motor nerves are in the spinal cord themselves in the gray matter. And the uh, sensory uh, cell bodies, the nerves or the cell bodies for the sensory nerves are in the dorsal root ganglion as it exits the nerve canal. So it's hypersensitive to compression or any irritation. It is the most common cause of radicular type pain pressure or irritation of that dorsal root uh, ganglion. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, the vertebral body. That is the bone of the vertebral, uh, the vertebrae. And um, there, are, you can see in the center of that picture how it looks kind of mottled. So there's a trabecular bone, which actually is like a sponge-like bone where calcium binds to it, makes it nice and firm. And on the outside of the vertebrae is a hard cancellous bone. So it's a thick, hard shell around that uh, softer foam-like interior. Um, when you get osteopenia, which is thinning of the bones because you get drawing out with calcium, you, get, you increase the risk of developing osteoporosis, which is uh, loss of bone, loss of calcium with con concomitant fractures. So osteoporosis is loss of bone, loss of calcium with a fracture. Osteomalacia or osteopenia is just loss of calcium predisposing you to fractures and uh, osteoporosis. Uh, facet joints are present there on that exam as well. Those are joints that help guide the motion of the spine. We don't really see the vertebral disc, but I'll show it on the next slide so you can get some idea. There are, are different types of uh, spinous processes that occur. You have the posterior spinous processes and you have the transverse spinous processes. These are really attachment points for ligaments and muscles. So they play a key role in stabiliz stabilizing your spine. That's why keeping those muscles strong, those ligaments uh, taut, uh, helps stabilize and support this structure. And this structure is important because it protects the nerves and also gives us our upright posture. So uh, just another picture of some of the ligament structures that we were talking that I was just talking about. You can see in the spine, we have the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is a broad-based ligament that encompasses the anterior part of the vertebral uh, bodies and the discs and really helps stabilize that structure. And behind that, in the canal itself, there's something called the posterior longitudinal ligament, and that's on the right side, that way up. Um, that actually uh, drops down inside of the canal, protects the disc from herniating back, but when you get down lower to the L4 and L5 level, it narrows down quite a bit. So the disc can herniate around that outside, so it makes it more prone to the uh, sequelae of the disc herniation. Um, in addition, you see other spinous, intraspinous, transverse spinous ligaments. So it's heavily uh, encapsulated in this thick uh, uh, fibrous tissue in, uh, attached to muscles. And um, you, can, you can see the facet capsule. Even around the facet joint, there's thick fibrous ligaments around that area.
uh, the disc itself. Here's a, 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 uh, a depiction of a intervertebral disc. Now, it's an artist's depiction, but I like this picture because it shows the lamellae. Lamellae are the layers in the disc. So actually, there are layers of uh, cartilage uh, into this disc material. And you notice the striations of that disc counterpose each other. They crisscross, almost like a basket weave. So within that material, that collagen, that, the cartilage of the disc, there are chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are live cells that make tissue, that make uh, the uh, small spicules of collagen that form the ligament. And they're really important because they're there to help the healing process. So if there's an injury, it can create more collagen to fill in the spaces that are injured. Uh, but unfortunately, over time, what happens is you're not getting good nutrition to that to those chondrocytes, and they can't make that material fast enough to counteract the damage that uh, is occurring. So you get ultimately deterioration of that disc as we age. Now, within this disc, you can see the, the, the lamellae, the, the several layers of lamellae, form what's called the annulus fibrosis. And the disc is, it's just a circular ligament. And that circular ligament encompasses something called the nucleus propulsus. The nucleus propulsus is a proteoglycan. And what is that? That's protein and sugar. So there's a large sugar molecule and attached to that, like a feather, there are these little protein molecules that come off that area. And they're all negatively charged. And they're negatively charged, they attract water. So they de develop like this a bond to water. So much like you make jello, you add you have powder and you add water, it becomes a sol semi-solid. It's very similar to that. So it's mostly, it's 99% water, but there's a, uh, a protein sh uh, sugar matrix that it binds to. And so when you put pressure on it, when you put pressure on that disc, it dissipates the forces equally along the inner wall of that annulus, diffusing the forces. So it makes an excellent compression device. And um, it acts like a fluid. And uh, when you get little tears and rents in those little layers of lamellae, that material is under very high pressure. When you're sitting, you might have 250 PSI within that uh, nucleus propulsus. When you're standing, it might be 150. So standing is actually better than sitting for your back. When you're uh, bending and lifting, that can go up to uh, 500 to 1,000 PSI, depending on the position that you have. So the way you lift is really important because that higher the PSI level, the higher pressure within the nucleus propulsus, the more likely it's going to extravasate into the other layers of the lamellae and deteriorate the disc even more. So uh, if the structure is really important, anatomy is really important, and physiology of the, the cells and how they uh, respond are really important. So uh, here's a normal disc diagram. And I, I like this diagram because it gives kind of a depiction of what we're talking about. And um, there's innervation to the disc. Actually, there's nerve endings that um, innervate the disc itself. And there's something called the ventral gray ramus. And you can see along the right side, it, it basically innervates the edges of the disc into the anterior, uh, anterior one third of that disc. And if there's tears or rants or injury to that area, it'll, it'll send a pain signal. In addition, there's uh, another uh, branch of the dorsal ramus that comes behind the disc and sends in um, uh, proprioceptors and pain sensors into the material itself. And that's the sinovertebral nerve. And uh, that is probably one of the main areas where you would get discogenic pain. And a lot of treatments are geared toward treating these nerve endings to deaden them a little bit so they don't send this intense pain signal on a continual basis. Because sometimes as the disc deteriorates, constant pressure is put on that area. And uh, when there is inflammation, those nerve endings tend to grow deeper into the tissue and uh, uh, can develop into chronic uh, painful situations. In addition, what I like about this diagram as well, it depicts the spinal canal. So at the lower part, right behind, behind the annulus fibrosis, the green structure, there's the black surface within the green nerve roots within the middle. And we have to understand the end of L1, the lumbar area, the top of that area, L1-2, the spinal cord ends. Below that are nerve roots that drop down, kind of like a horse's tail. You know, the meat of the tail and all the horse hair comes down. That's why we call it the cotaquana because it's, I guess it's Latin for uh, horse's tail. And um, so those nerve roots go down through that canal and each nerve root exits a specific neural framing. And before it exits, it's like us driving on the highway. If we want to get off on an exit ramp, we got to get on the ramp first to, before we exit. And an area called the lateral recess, which is where those NRs are right at the top edge of that black substance, 
they're exiting down, they're in the exit ramp before they go out the nerve canal. And it's in a specific location, right where the disc herniates, and uh, the, there's a facet joint right below it. Right below the normal disc sign is a facet joint, and that joint can become hypertrophic over time because of arthritis, and it can grow into that canal. Combined with the disc bulging backwards, you get a little nerve sandwich right in that lateral recess. So it's a very common area where you get nerve impingement. And it's tough to get at, especially uh, from the surgeon standpoint, because they can decompress an area, but it's really hard to get behind that area and decompress those nerve roots. So it might be one of the reasons why you don't get the optimal results from some of the surgeries that occur just from simple laminectomies. Um, here is a, a depiction of how that disc deteriorates. Um, here we see that uh, on the left hand side, you see the cervical spine. Here we have the spinal cord right above the disc area. And on either side of that spinal cord, you see some lig the pink ligaments. And to the side of that, we see those two ovoid egg-like structures. Those are actually facet joints. Those are articulations that allow movement in the spine. And we'll go into more detail on that. Uh, but there you can see a normal disc with uh, the nucleus pulposus well demarcated within that disc. So all that water and, and that gelatinous substance is well encapsulated. As, you, as the disc deteriorates, you see that material seeping through the walls, and we call that uh, fibrotic changes of the annulus, and uh, that material starts to break down into it. And if you look on an MRI scan, you'll see graying out of that, of that disc. So you see a graying here, and we call it a dehydrated disc. And it could be dehydrated, it could be just the water in the, within that disc, the gelatinous substance is just spreading out and becoming less demarcated. Um, this is a precursor to a disc herniation because a perfectly well-maintained disc is very unlikely to acutely herniate. Usually the herniation occurs after some deter deterioration and there's some evidence that that material seeping through and there's some event that causes it to seep all the way through. And you see on the far right depicting a actual disc herniation. And you can see how that disc is herniated. The nucleus pulposus is coming through the material of the uh, the wall of that disc, and it's actually causing impingement of the nerve root, and I think this depicts it better. Uh, here you see another diagram where you have a normal disc, and then you actually have uh, the disc herniating, tearing the ligaments uh, at, through a certain portion and, and impinging the nerve, and you can actually see the compressed nerve root. Uh, most of the time that material, as it comes out, it's very uh, pro-inflammatory. So when you tear a ligament, where that nucleus pulposus comes into the general milieu of the spine, it can actually cause severe inflammation. And uh, like if you sprain your ankle, your ankle swells up. All you're doing is tearing the ligament a little bit. The anterior talofibular ligament is most commonly torn just a little bit. The whole ankle swells up. Well, this is kind of like a pressure cooker in there because it doesn't really have the ability to expand. So the materials, the inflammatory materials sit on there and it's like Tabasco sauce on your tongue. It really irritates that nerve, and really prolonged inflammatory substances on the nerve itself can cause damage to the nerve, as well as actual compression to the nerve itself. So there's varying things, and there's several treatment, treatment options for that that we can help. Uh, you can see here in the spinal canal, the nerve root is the cauda equina, the, the phylum terminale in the middle, which is that long cord from the tip of the uh, conus medullaris or the end of the spinal cord going down the tailbone. Uh, but you can see the nerve roots, the cauda equina is there. So that would be below L1-2 level, probably uh, to L2 to L, uh, L5-S1. So um, uh, kind of going into some of the risk factors for spinal disease or uh, back problems, neck problems, occupational hazards. Clearly, if you're going to be working for a moving company, you're going to be driving all the time. Uh, there are occupational hazards that can occur. Uh, even typing on a... On a uh, typewriter or a computer terminal, not typewriter, see how old I am, but um, <laughs> the uh, computer terminal all day long can give you carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, and that can cause problems in your hands and arms and maybe uh, misdiagnosed as nerve pain from your neck. Uh, sedentary jobs are just as bad as heavy lifting jobs. Uh, when you sit for prolonged periods of time, you're putting increased pressure on those discs. As I said before, the PSI level increases and uh, the muscles and the ligaments in your back are being stretched in the wrong direction. The muscles are weakening. So the support structure for the spine uh, deconditions. And that's one of the major uh, causes of uh, lower back problems. I think probably the most common cause in our society today. Uh,
Um, yeah, most people, women and women, it, it, it's equal until you get to about 60 years old. Uh, you develop osteomalacia or thinning of the bone in women uh, more commonly after 60, and that can contribute to advancing degenerative change and uh, compression fractures, which are a common cause of uh, back condition, back, excuse me, especially in the thoracic lumbar uh, regions. Um, you know, you can be born with varying genetic changes, size and shape of your canal. You can have a, a small canal. So there's very little room for error. So if there's a little disc herniation, it can cause big problems. Uh, smoking, uh, coughing, uh, just the act of smoking, just the chemicals in your, uh, that you're exposed to are pro-inflammatory. They affect the healing process of those chondrocytes and uh, the disc deteriorate. Your body deteriorates faster than it would be if you didn't. Uh, so it's a good idea if you can stop to it. Uh, extended driving due to low back strain, as I said, stress and other psychological factors, very important. Um, you know, pain can cause stress, but stress can also contribute to aggravation of uh, painful problems. And when you're in a stressed uh, situation, you release cortisol, you release all these pro-inflammatory substances, and that can make your back pain worse. So um, exercise reduces stress, it also increases muscle strength. So it doesn't, well, it can cost you something if you go to the gym, but if you have a good exercise program and stay active, um, you're gonna uh, forego a lot of expensive medical treatment potentially in the future. <laughs> um, strenuous labor, as we said, that's part of the occupational hazards. Uh, epidemiology, uh, the prevalence of uh, low back pain is really common. So adults get, about 50% of adults during a year get back pain. That's a lot. Uh, 15 to 20% of these people seek medical attention. And uh, so there's a lot of people not being treated and living with it. Uh, it's the number one cause of disability in Americans younger than 45 years old, which is huge. Not just the cost of medical care for these people, but the loss of work. I mean, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars. It's one of the most uh, dramatic uh, costs to society. So it's something we really need to kind of get a hold of and hopefully prevent. <laughs> rather than having to treat it on the back end. Um, natural progression of lower back pain, 70% of people when they get lo acute lower back problems that uh, improve in, si in two weeks. After uh, six weeks, 90% of people generally are better. Uh, but after the six to 12 week period, that equals about 3% of patients, uh, they have chronic pain, it doesn't go away. And that costs, uh, the cost of that are 50% of all the treatment for lower back pain or for that 3% of the population that doesn't get better. So my goal is to try to figure out where the pain's coming from. So the big question to me when a patient comes in, I wanna know what is causing their pain? And it's not always generally apparent. Someone may say, I hurt in my hip or groin. It could be referred pain. You can have leg pain and numbness in the, in the foot or pain in the foot. It could be in a pinched nerve in your back. It could be your foot. So there's always things we, got, we have to take into consideration. There we have a compact disc. <laughs> Um, back pain and assessment and diagnosis. So when a patient comes to me in the office, I'm going to ask them a lot of questions because I really want to know um, how things started. I want to get some good background information, especially to identify some of those red flags that we talked about, infections, cancer, uh, aneurysms, all those, all those things. So history is really important. Uh, so you, you, that's the, one of the most key elements of history and physical. So I want to ask in general, when did the pain begin? How long has it been going on for? Um, has it been getting worse? Is it progressing? Is it getting better? Is it uh, plateaued? Is it vary depending on activity? Uh, I want to find out, did, they, did you have trauma beforehand? Uh, what precipitated the symptoms? Did it just incur insidiously and progressively without any uh, injuries? You want to know what patients' hobbies are, what activities they do, because you, know, you can develop pain days after an injury and not tie the two together. Um, it's not always, uh, always generally apparent. So um, you also have to ask, does the pain stay in the back? Does it travel down the leg? Uh, uh, where, does the, where does it go in your leg? So it's really important. So if, if you have a nerve injury in a specific location, you're gonna have pain down a certain dermatome. And what's a dermatome? A dermatome is an area of skin that the nerve innervates. And every single nerve at different levels innervates a specific area of skin. And that gives us a lot of information. 
So if you come to me and you have, you know, this acute onset of lower back pain, it's been going on for several weeks, it's not getting better, you start to get some leg pain, maybe a little weakness with that, I'm concerned that you may have a disc herniation. So I will ask you, where is the pain going in your leg? And I'll do a sensory exam and on my physical exam, but the questions will identify a problem. Maybe they have thigh pain, it goes to the knee and the inside of the leg. So I'll think, well, that could be potentially an L4 dermatillomal pattern. So when I get an MRI or an advanced study, I'm going to be really looking at the MRI scan and looking specifically at the L4 area to see what's hurting you. Because when you get an MRI scan, it's a great study and it shows tons of stuff. And by the time you're 50, there's a lot of stuff accumulating in your spine over time, the degenerative changes. So it's very difficult to ascertain what's hurting. It's so, because it's just a picture. And it's like taking a picture of a refrigerator and trying to figure out the temperature. It's very difficult. So these clinical find, these clinical assessments are really important for us to kind of focus in on a specific area. Um, if I were to get an MRI and a thousand people who have no back pain at 50 years old, half those people would have uh, concurrent disc herniations and not even know it. So uh, you really have to look at those studies in light of the physical exam. Um, it, it, like I said, is there any weakness associated with it? That would indicate more nerve-related uh, nerve problem. And we want to really be very attentive to that because we don't want progressive weakness or numbness developing and causing permanent injury. So we want to be pretty quick on uh, getting the appropriate studies and the appropriate treatment. And that might include in, uh, injections that we'll talk about. It might also include a surgical intervention. It might just include just uh, good physical therapy and traction. Um, and, you know, ascertaining those red flags, is there loss of bowel or bladder functioning? When you have uh, caught equina syndrome or compression of those, that, all those nerve roots, you're gonna develop bowel and bladder dysfunction. And it, it is really retention of the bowel and retention of the bladder. So it's retention, it's not, not always frequency. That may be just a bladder issue, but when you can't pee, that's important. When, you can't, when you're constipated, you can't go, and you have concomitant back pain, it's, it's getting worse. You don't always have a lot of back pain when you've caught equina syndrome. It may be just those systemic symptoms. So we always have to keep these things in consideration. Do you have fever? Does it wake you up at night all the time? So there's a lot of questions. And um, you know, everybody wakes up with back pain a little bit at night. You have some arthritic pain, so don't don't go crazy about that. But um, you know, it's good to get someone who knows what they're doing at least to talk to you about it to see if that is something that is a red flag or not. So uh, the physical exam, again, this is a really important aspect to uh, making that assessment to try to figure out what's going on in terms of where the pain is coming from. Uh, we look at, uh, when, I, when a patient first comes in to see me, I have them just stand in front of me. I look at to see if there's any shifting or if they're leaning forward, uh, if there's any bending of the shoulders one way or the other, if the patient can walk in a nice even fashion, their hips are level and they're rotating their hips properly. Um, I, is, does, it, can the patient toe and heel stand? It's a great assessment for balance and weakness and numbness. If you have a pinched nerve at L5, you can't stand on your heel. Uh, if you have a pinched nerve at S1, you can't stand on your toes. So, it, and it shows up on that exam very easily. I mean, I, I, in, in my exam is not only neurologic functioning, but uh, palpation, we look at tender spots, uh, bone and joint involvement, we look for weakness of the lower extremities, nerve in, in involvement, we test reflex functioning, uh, sensory uh, motor functioning. Uh, range, we look at range of motion limitations. Uh, this could be indicative of uh, severe muscle spasms, uh, nerve or arthritic conditions. So all uh, the physical exam is the actual very instrumental part of really honing in on where we're gonna look at and what kind of studies we may look at in the future along with the history and visit, uh, as long, along with the thorough uh, history as well. Um, diagnostic imaging, depending on what we see on the physical exam and the history, uh, we, we might just get spine x-rays. If patients had some chronic pain and it has been getting better over the last several weeks, they come in to see me, they might've had a trauma. I'd probably get some x-rays right off the bat just to see if there are any congenital abnormalities, to look at disc space height, to look at other things. There could be uh, kidney stones, there could be other things that we can pick up. You can see compression fractures, dislocations, and things like that. So it's a good screening study. Um, uh, CT scans or uh, x-rays that are kind of like an MRI, that are very good for looking at uh, fractures and, and bone predominantly. You can see discs fairly well, but an MRI scan is really the gold standard when it comes to looking at soft tissues like disc herniations, nerve impingements, 
cancers and things like that, infections. All that, that's a very important compression fractures, whether they're new or old, an MRI scan really does help with that. Um, bone scans are also helpful in determining the age of a, a fracture, or if there's occult fractures that we can't see on an x-ray, uh, even on the MRI scan. You take, can't take an MRI of everything, so a bone scan is a good general study. We can look at uh, any type of occult fractures in the sacrum, pelvis, the spine, and, and uh, anywhere on the extremities. Uh, there's nerve conduction studies. Nerve conduction studies are helpful in delineating uh, conundrums that we run into. If someone has some neck pain and has numbness and tingling in their hand, well, it could be from their neck. If we get an MRI and there's nothing going on in their neck, then uh, we might consider getting an EMG test to see if there's a carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, which is compression around the elbow, or if there's a thoracic outlet syndrome where you have compression of the brachial plexus as it drops down through the shoulder, and it goes underneath the, uh, the scalene muscles, the middle scalene muscle, the clavicle, and the pectoralis minor. Um, as far as uh, that study, it's really to rule out other things that are not common, like peripheral neuropathies. If the patient comes in, they have numbness and tingling in their feet. Um, in a nerve test might help delineate that. So there's some good tests. Here's a dynamic stud x-ray, and I'd like to show this. Uh, after a trauma, it's good to look at this, to look at stability of the spine. Here we see good extension on the right side, but on the left side you see straightening. It should have a little bit of a curvature, and you see some uh, uh, what we call a wry neck or decreased lord um, kyphosis in that flex position. So you know there's muscle spasm associated with that or bad arthritic changes. Um, here's a lumbar spine where we can look at, it's not a great spine picture, unfortunately, uh, sorry, but we can look at the SI joints, we can look at the sacrum, we can look at the alignment of the spine, we can see the ribs, we can count the number of vertebrae on the AP image, on the uh, lateral image, we can again see disc heights, we can see if there's any slippage of the vertebrae, and we can see normal alignment. And if we get oblique studies, we can look, actually look at the joints and the neural framing. So we can get some good ideas of what might be going on. We can also see other structures that might also be contributing to uh, referred pain into the back because there are things like kidney infections, tumors, abscesses that can cause in extrinsic pressure and mimic back pain. So it's a good screening tool. Uh, when, to advance, uh, when to order advanced radiologic imaging, like an MRI being the gold standard, uh, usually, if there's no acute problems or major red flags on history and physical, an MRI scan might be indicated if patient has continued symptoms that are non-responsive to medications, home exercises, alteration of activities, and physical therapy uh, or chiropractic treatment. Uh, then an MRI might be indicated. If the patient has a trauma or any progressive sensory or motor deficits or bowel bladder dysfunction, you know, we may jump right to an MRI scan right off the bat. Um, I just wanted to show a picture. If no one's been in an MRI unit before, there's different kinds of MRIs. And here's a picture of an open MRI unit. Uh, a lot of people are claustrophobic and don't realize it. So you've been, in, you, you're not, you know, you're not normally in a tight spot. Uh, but it, and this gives you a pretty broad range. Most people can tolerate going in this place without having to take any medication or being sedated. Uh, the smaller MRI scan and the closed units are tight. And usually when you go in, you have your, they put a blindfold on you, they play music and blow air on your face. It, it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. But they're tight, but they get a very good image because the magnet's really close and it gets a good image. So the image might be a little superior uh, a lot of times to the open units. So it's gonna be up to the physician to decide what kind of unit you're gonna get. And uh, some people just can't go in those claustrophobic places. There are our upright images, actually here in Jacksonville, they have a nice upright image. Uh, we have our own imaging uh, facility here, MRI scan that we use, which is great because we can we have direct access to that and can order specific studies. Um, patient has, uh, this is an MRI scan of the lumbar spine, just to give you a kind of some depiction. This is the lower lumbar area. We see the vertebral bodies of L3, L4, L5, and S1, and then you see the S1-2, that's the, sac the fused portion of that sacrum. On, uh, at L4-5 in the middle, you see at an annular tear. That's actually some of that disc material migrating through that lamellae, those layers of the disc, and going toward the, the, the posterior, the last maybe ligament of the annulus fibrosis versus the posterior longitudinal ligament, and it's pushing, displacing that. You can see some of the fluid from that disc displacing. 
that could be due to uh, an annular tear, could be due to trauma, it could be a non traumatic event too. Uh, and again, you have a disc bulge at the L5S1 level, and you have a lot of loss of disc height. At the L5S1 level, there should be actually a larger disc space than the L4-5 level. And when you see that deteriorate, deterioration, um, you look at other things. Here we see modic changes on the MRI scan of the bone. And what's really important and might be a clue as to why this disc deteriorated is that over time, because of impact, it impinges the, uh, that vascular capillary bed on the base of that bone that feeds those chondrocytes within the disc. And when you get edema or compression, which is shown up on modic changes where it gets that little light color in the bone right above that disc, that edema prevents that blood flow. And that if you can't get the blood flow to that tissue, it's not going to perform and heal the way it should. So uh, these problems develop and uh, can develop over time and may lead to, uh, they may be benign and just deteriorate and become stabilized. Uh, they may become unstable and need uh, surgical uh, uh, fusion. So it can lead to problems at times as well. Um, I just wanted to show some other uh, MRI scans. Here's the cervical spine. You can see the medulla oblongata. You got the uh, spinal cord coming down, maybe some of the uh, cerebellum there. And uh, you see compression of the spinal cord. Here we have a disc protrusion herniation, right where those arrows are pointing up and down. And you see arthritic changes, a spur of that joint. And you notice the hourglass configuration of the spinal cord. That's really bad because that means that there's, and you see the change in color inside the spinal cord. That means there may be a myelopathy or damage to the spinal cord. And that would result in ataxic gait. A patient may come with uh, symptoms like this may come in. They can't walk very well. Their feet are widened. They get a, this staggering gait we call ataxia. Um, also, they'll get very really hyperreflexic. Their reflexes will be off the chart. You touch them, it'll, it'll just jump very quickly. Uh, you'll have Babinski signs, which are abnormal signs. You may also see Hoffman's testing in the hands, too, that indicate uh, damage to the spinal cord. So anywhere above L1-2, there's potential for damage to the spinal cord. Below L1-2, compression is a cardioquina, or compression of those nerve roots, uh, most commonly caused by a uh, condition of spinal stenosis. Here's traumatic injury to the cervical spine I wanted to go over. Here you actually see at the C5-6 level a uh, anterolysis or slippage of the vertebrae over the other vertebrae. This is an unstable segment and you can see it's also causing a little bit of compression of that spinal cord and there, uh, there may even be a little bit of uh, myelomalacia in the spinal cord indicating edema in the cord or trauma to the spinal cord itself. So uh, red flag surgery. <laughs> Um, causes of uh, pain, lower back and extremities. Again, there are, there are several uh, causes of problems. Uh, as we were talking about, um, there are deformities of the spine, scoliosis being the major deformity. Kyphosis can occur over time with patients with osteopenia. They may have uh, congenital de defects of the vertebrae where they're fused and wedged. Um, and that can cause kyphotic deformities or gibbous deformities. Um, fibromyalgia and, and myofascial pain, two different things. Myofascial pain may be more related to a local response like facet pain or disc problems. Fibromyalgia is more generalized, uh, centrally mediated pain syndrome that gives you uh, joint pain and generalized muscle uh, discomfort. Emotional stress, as we talked about, stress, cortisol levels go through the roof. Um, it, it is a pro-inflammatory environment and uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, exercise, counseling, medication, all is something helpful in addressing those issues if needed. Uh, vertebral compression fractures, again, as the bone thins, especially in women, which is most common, or with cancer, things like that, the bone can actually thin out, becomes very spongy and weak, and any type of force can, even coughing or sneezing, can cause a compression fracture, especially in the thoracic area. Um, and that will contribute to kyphosis or that forward flexing of the body. Infection, osteomyelitis, abscesses, arachnoiditis. These are all conditions that occur in the spinal canal. Arachnoiditis might do, be due to a trauma, um, a, a surgery, a uh, chemical irritant. And I know someone had asked a question about that. <clears throat> 
So arachnoiditis is very difficult and it can get scarring around that tissue. There are a lot of nerve endings in that tissue. So the scarring causes adhesions and it, it can be very painful in a chronic condition. And uh, it's a tough thing to treat. Really, there are no surgical options. Um, there are options uh, such as a dorsal column stimulator, spinal cord stimulator, very, very helpful for conditions like this. So you can actually do a trial. Yeah, try it out and see how you like it. If it doesn't work, you don't make any incision. We place this special electrode that blocks the pain sensation as it ducasates up the spinal canal after the uh, injury and or more proximal or caudal excuse me, more cephalad to the injury, and um, <clears throat> that may be very helpful. Osteomyelitis, abscesses have to be treated aggressively in terms of treating those, those things. I was, uh, one time I was re recommended to see a patient that was admitted to the hospital for a uh, urosepsis infection of the of bladder, um, treated with antibiotics, fine, no problem, then developed spontaneous low back pain and leg pain. So I got an MRI scan because of the increasing leg pain. The uh, patient was in the 70s, and um, I went down, you know, they, they, I got a preliminary report that said circumscribed disc herniations. So I'm like, hmm. an old person like that doesn't get circumscribed disc herniations because over, eight, over time, the discs dehydrate a little bit, and it's not as likely. So it raised a red flag to me and in the light of the fact that she had a septic uh, infection. So I went down to check out that MRI scan, and it turned out to be a huge uh, epidural abscess, and that patient subsequently died from that abscess. And if I had done any injections or any treatment, it would have been big trouble for me. <laughs> so luckily, we found out what it was. So it's really important to figure out the cause of those problems. Um, uh, unfortunately, they tried everything, and, and they, they couldn't control the infection. Um, other things, cancer, as we talked about, uh, referred pain is another common cause joint pain, disc problems, they can refer into the hip and groin. Uh, radiating pain is more nerve related, that goes farther or past the knee. Uh, joint pain and disc pain can cause pain across the hip, groin, uh, buttock, and down in the thigh. Uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome is also a common cause of extremity pain, uh, not as much in the lower back. Uh, other problems that may develop into leg pain or nerve-related pain include, include post-traumatic neuralgia, and you can, it, that is something that can be very uncomfortable. Again, possibly treated with a dorsal column simulator. If it, isn't treat, it, it cannot be treated with uh, medications. There's some really great medicines that are non-narcotic that can be helpful for these chronic neuropathic conditions. And I think that was another question I thought I'd touch on. So if you have any other questions, send them in. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, kind of what happens with acute low, low back pain. What is acute low back pain? It's, some, it's low back pain that's been uh, onset less than three months time period. It's, uh, is it non-radiating? Is it radiating? So initially we treat radiating and non-radiating uh, back problems that are acute the same. We start out with uh, anti-inflammatory muscle relaxant medications. If they can't take anti-inflammatories, Tylenol. If a patient has severe radiating pain, it's extremely uncomfortable. Occasionally, we'll use an opiate analgesic for a short period of time, uh, but we try to steer away from that for any type of long-term treatment. Um, initial treatment is the same, except uh, in, in cases of uh, bladder uh, or bowel dysfunction, as we described, or progressive numbness or weakness. Um, so anybody who has progressive weakness and numbness, we really need to uh, be more aggressive in terms of treating that, in terms of studies and uh, going forward with other treatments. So there are a lot of different treatments you can have. Heating pads are one of them. Uh, I guess it worked fairly well for this snowman. However, I see a lot of patients that use heating pads on their back and they're literally burned and scarred from those heating pads. And um, so you gotta be really careful with these modalities. Ice, heat, all these things can, uh, up and over a prolonged period, you can get frostbite in the skin and get damage to the skin that way. The heating pad damage is, is terrible, it looks horrible. It's all modeled afterwards. Um, so always have a, a terry cloth towel or something in between that heating pad, ice, only use 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off, give yourself a little break between that. Ice tends to last longer when you have muscle spasms because ice constri constricts the capillaries in the muscle tissue and that allows it to stay cooler longer. When you heat tissue, it dilates those capillaries and it cools the tissues out faster when the heat's removed. So uh, it cools quicker. So the prolonged effect of cold, although a lot of people don't like that cold sensation. Um, so acute low back problems, 
uh, relative rest for a day or two. I never have patients do bit much bed rest. I mean, any more than two days of bed rest actually is more deleterious for you because of deconditioning. If you laid in bed and didn't move a muscle for five days, you'd lose half your muscle strength. You lose it much faster than you gain it. And to get back half your muscle strength may take you six months. So, and you can lose it in five days. So staying in bed is not really good for your back, but if it's the only alternative for a short period of time before you can see somebody or get to the emergency room, then um, it's, an op it's an option if you have to. Ice and heat, as we mentioned, non steroidal inflammatories, analgesics and muscle relaxants, the first tier treatment, uh, steroid packs, I do that a lot. Medrol dose packs, usually I'll accelerate that dose pack, increase the dosage in the beginning. Chiropractic, acupuncture, physical therapy, uh, alteration, avoiding certain activities. Uh, Non-radiating lower back pain causes, uh, could be muscular, could be arthritic conditions, cancer, fractures, osteoporosis, spondylolisthesis or slippage of the vertebrae, spondylolysis, which is a, a fracture of the pars interarticularis, which is a bone or strut that actually prevents the vertebrae from falling forward. So these are all very confusing. But spondylolisthesis, suffice it to say, we saw it in the cervical spine where the, the vertebrae was slipped forward. And usually in order for the spondylolisthesis to occur, you have a spondylolysis, which is the strut breaks, and that we call that the pars interarticularis. And that strut holds that vertebrae in place. When that strut is broken between the vertebrae, and that's the space between the joints, pars interarticularis, uh, that's what it means, uh, then uh, we need to evaluate that. And sometimes you need a fusion for type of treatments like that. But I see that very commonly in gymnasts, young gymnasts, bones aren't formed all the way. And when they do a dismount off a high, a high bar, and a landing that go into hyperextension that puts a lot of force on those joints and commonly develops into a spondylolysis, which is a fracture. And then subsequent over time develops a spondylolisthesis where that, because of the fracture and those support structures, it, it slips forward. Other conditions that cause non-rating pain is ankylosing spondylitis. This is a rheumatologic condition that affects the joints of the spine and can be related to uh, many different causes one of them that is commonly overlooked is psoria psor psoriatic arthritis can affect the spine. And um, patients with uh, psoriasis have, uh, are very high risk of developing uh, joint conditions and, um, and developing ankylosing spondylitis. So I see that a lot in my practice. Uh, radiating lower back pain uh, can be from a disc herniation as we, as we depicted in uh, or saw in those other uh, slides where the disc is actually causing an impingement on that nerve. It creates an inflammatory reaction around that nerve. All those things can irritate that nerve and send pain down the dermatome of that nerve. So it's an L4, it's gonna go in a specific dermatome compared to the L5, S1, and you can have dual uh, complaints. You can have a disc that herniates into the neural foramen and lateral recess encroaching on two nerve uh, structures. And that's commonly seen. Um, because there's a lot of associated arthritis, facet hypertrophic changes, and remember that that also impinges the canal and makes it smaller. So if there's a disc herniation, uh, it doesn't have to be very big to cause clinical symptoms. Uh, other problems include spinal stenosis. This is a really common problem in older uh, patients that develop arthritis. It's an active person's disease. So I see jocks, they come in and they're like, they're walking and then all of a sudden their posture, they lean forward, more forward, more forward like this. Um, that can be from two things, arthritis developing, but a combination of the arthritis and disc problems and thickening of the ligaments causes narrowing in that spinal cord and gives you that hourglass configuration. And uh, the stenosis causes impingement of those nerve roots. Those nerve roots become ischemic. So the blood, there's something called the neurovasorum, which is actually a capillary bed that surrounds all these little nerves. When you put compression on that nerve, it obstructs that blood flow. When you obstruct that blood flow, you get ischemic pain. And that ischemic pain, you might wake up at night sometimes sleeping on your arm, your hand goes numb or your leg goes numb. That's kind of similar to what we're talking about. And it's very intense. And what happens is over time, you'll be walking along and then you can't walk anymore. You got to sit down and sitting down makes it feel great. And you can go to the grocery store and push the cart around. But uh, the minute you uh, start walking upright, it starts to hurt again. And you get things called neuroclodication complaints or cramping down the legs when it becomes severe. And you know you might mistake in that for well I got poor circulation in my legs and it could be vascular claudication. So a good way to differentiate between the two 
is when you're walking up a hill, your spine feels better. So you can walk up a hill with spinal stenosis, but you can't walk up a hill because it's harder to do that. So the vascular uh, claudication complaints get worse. So that's kind of how to differentiate those two if you think you might have that problem. Um, I know I'm going on and on, and God bless you if you can keep up with me, but there's a lot of stuff. And I'll just kind of keep it, keep it rolling and, you know, go get a cup of coffee, ice cream or whatever it is now that you're probably at dessert now. Um, uh, as we talked about cancer, any type of things that can obstruct the canal infections, they all can do that. So they all contribute to radiating pain. And here's again, is that disc protrusion, herniation, uh, causing compression of that nerve root. And here's some additional uh, pictures of stenosis. And here you can see that hourglass configuration in both locations. And um, when you're standing, it narrows more. And when you're sitting, it opens it up a little bit. So you can tolerate sitting, standing and walking upright position or laying flat in the bed, you'll start to get cramps down your legs. And um, it can be very uncomfortable. And it's, I do some injections that are great for it, but ultimately if it becomes severe, surgery is the best treatment for that. And you know, I don't do that surgery. It doesn't benefit me to say a surgeon to do that because, you know, I'd like to try to get you better without surgery if we can, but this is a condition that really necessitates it. So if you're well enough and medically stable enough to be able to do that kind of uh, surgery, it's, it will help tremendously for the symptoms that you have. And it really improve your mobility and function. So you may think, oh, I'm too old to get surgery. But if you're not walking and being active, that's much worse for, me, for you in the long run, and even the short run, than a, a simple operation. And the surgeries nowadays for this are are very quick. Uh, same day surgeries are usually home in the afternoon without any issues. Um, we kind of go through the spinal stenosis where you get narrowing and it's usually over 50 years of age, uh, develops lower back pain and you get leg pain with walking, you get neurotrophication complaints. Uh, it can be one leg or usually both sides. Uh, increased pain with walking uh, down a hill when you have a stenosis, better walking up a hill when you have stenosis, but worse when you have vascular claudication, which is vascular uh, insufficiency. Um, and, and we have the shopping cart sign. Again, when you're at the grocery store, it's much better walking around pushing that cart. So that's a good indicator that you might be developing stenosis if you're at that age category and you're having increased pain and leg symptoms. So lumbar radiculopathy or sciatica, uh, one to 2% of low back patients have a compressed or inflamed uh, nerve root. Uh, most common levels are L4-5 and L5-S1, and we discussed that. That's the lower part of the lumbar spine. Most of the weight and, and uh, rotational activities are in those segments. So there's a lot more force and stresses in that area, number one. And also the narrowing of that posterior longitudinal ligament uh, gives less resistance for that disc herniation to occur at those levels and impinge nerves. Um, and we talked about the fissuring of the disc and the tears. Uh, ridiculous symptoms increase with forward flexion. So seeing in a car, coughing, sneezing, bowel movements, it can aggravate that sciatic. So increasing intrathecal pressure by doing a valsalva. Valsalva is like putting pressure like if you're going to the bathroom. Uh, that can cause increased intrathecal pressure in your spinal canal, and that can irritate the nerve as it passes out the nerve canal in, in the area of compression. Um, and usually you get decreased pain with lying supine with your knees flexed up. And, uh, and standing is actually better than sitting. Treatment for sciatica is uh, most people get better, 50% get better within one month of conservative therapy. But the pain can be excruciating and patients do not want to live with this pain for that long if they can, if they can help it. So um, dynamic exercise, traction can be helpful, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory muscle relaxants, uh, occasionally, like we said, when it, if it's really severe, you know, a short period of time of narcotic or analgesic uh, medicines like that might be a benefit. Uh, but what can really help with a severe sciatica that is intolerable uh, and, and to get you back to work and active again and getting you really involved in physical therapy, because I'll tell you, when you have a severe sciatica, even get any type of movement, even getting into therapy can really aggravate your symptoms. And sometimes, the injections are very helpful. In interlaminar, caudal, or transforaminal injections, I mostly, mostly do the transforaminal injections because it's getting down right along where the nerve is being compressed and enters into the spinal canal through that area and, and closer proximity to the disc and the pathology that's going on. 
So I do find over the 25 years that I've been practicing that it, I have the best uh, outcomes from that procedure. Um, the indications for doing that, relief of pain, nerve root irritation. Uh, despite this, surgery, patients go to surgery approximately five to 10% of the time uh, with disc herniations. And sometimes if there's severe compression of the nerve, it's the way to go. I think they've done some studies in uh, Great Britain where the five-year outcome study is the same, but if you're getting progressive neurologic deficits and the pain is so bad you can't work and do the things that you need to do, it's really not an option to wait five years. Um, approximately 280,000 people per year get this surgery, um, and uh, those numbers are increasing, and uh, it is a cost to society, obviously. Um, here's a uh, surgical suite where we do injections. This is similar to what I do at uh, Southeast Orthopedic Center. Uh, we do everything through a catheter. We look on the fluoro unit or, or through a TV screen where we can actually see the placement of these needles. They have to be very, very specific um, and they can have a great outcome. This is a, a, a uh, injection in the transforaminal space where the dye flows in through the lateral recess in the area where the nerve's actually getting pinched by the disc and the, and the, the stenotic lesion. And uh, you can see that medicine as it tracks up, similar to the dye situation there. And um, there's also other problems that can cause non-radiating back pain, and one of them is facet disease or the joints in your back. Um, I want to just give you a, a, a picture so you have an understanding of what the facet joints are. So basically, you have the vertebral bodies, and then you have the, the disc, the annulus, that connects those two vertebrae and acts as a cushion. Um, that disc can move in any direction. It's freely movable. But the facet joints have a certain orientation. The facet joints are localized at the back of the spine, and they actually guide the motion of the spine. So the disc and the vertebral body can only move in the direction that the joints are oriented. And as you go lower into the lumbar spine, the joints widen out and allow more rotation. And as you go through the thoracic and cervical spine, they widen out again, and uh, you, it, acts, it allows for even more rotation and uh, mobility. Uh, but that can lead to more problems over time. But in the lower lumbar spine, uh, most of the upper and lower lumbar spine is very stable structure and has to be uh, that way. Um, it's called an amphiarthroidal joint. It allows motion, but it does not have a synovial lining. Whereas the facet joints are a diarthroidal joint or synarthroidal, excuse me, a synarthroidal joint that has a synovial lining. So it's just like any other form of joint, like the, like the joint of your finger. It has a certain range of motion and a certain motion. And uh, it is susceptible to osteoarthritic disease because as the disc deteriorates, more weight is put on the facet joint. And that can contribute to major problems of that joint. In general, as a, uh, normally the facet joints take about 15% of the body weight in that lower lumbar area. But as the discs degenerate, that number goes up. So it puts a lot more wear and tear on those joints. So they're very, you know, over time, everybody develops some form of degenerative change in those joints. And it can contribute to significant loss of mobility and pain. And that pain is usually referred across your buttock and hip. Uh, I work with a group of uh, great uh, hip surgeons, and uh, I get a lot of referrals from them for uh, back and groin pain. Uh, that is not related to the hip. Uh, it's related to their spine, and the, the facet joints can refer in that area as well as the SI joint. So I just wanted to give you a picture of what we're talking about here. So pain is usually uh, in the lower back. It can radiate to the hip buttocks, and uh, especially it can go into the anterior lateral thigh as well as the posterior thigh. The posterior thigh, usually SI joint will refer into, but the lower facet joints can as well. Unusual, uh, unusual for this pain is to go by the knee. So you don't usually get pain past the knee. So if patients complain of radiating pain past the knee, I think more neurogenic or nerve-related type of conditions. Uh, symptoms get worse with extension and prolonged standing because it's putting more pressure on those joints as you lean back and over to the side. Again, this is an active person's disease. I see a lot of uh, old older gentlemen, women that are really into sports, doing a lot of activities, tennis, golf, because of all the rotational stresses that we put on our spine, it really contributes to uh, uh, developing joint uh, pain and disease. And it can uh, present as a dull toothache pain, aching, stabbing pain. It can wake you up at night, turning in bed can aggravate it. So there's a lot of clinical symptoms we see. 
So there's treatment for it, lumbar stabilization programs, working on strengthening, core strengthening, uh, facet mobilizations. But if a joint's really inflamed, trying to mobilize an inflamed joint just makes it worse, and it increases the inflammatory response. So if they if they are aggravated, if patients become like yourself, become aggravated uh, but with physical therapy, um, usually I'll get them in. We'll do a diagnostic therapeutic injection into the joint, where I put a drop or two of anesthetic with a little bit of corticosteroid into that joint to reduce the inflammatory response. And uh, it helps, it does one of two things when I do that. If I numb the joint and your pain goes away, now we know where the pain's coming from. So it helps identify the problem. And number two, if I put a little anti-inflammatory in it, uh, just a small amount of corticosteroid, that helps reduce the inflammatory response. So over the next day or so, the inflammation goes down and you're more amenable to doing therapy and treatment. And uh, ultimately, if it's a condition that just keeps coming back despite the therapy, it, it, the uh, therapeutic diagnostic injections and your uh, changing activities and things like that, uh, we do something called an ablation. Uh, an ablation is uh, where we address the medial branch nerve of the dorsal ramus, which is a similar nerve to the sinovertebral nerve and the ventral gray ramus. It's a secondary nerve that comes off and innervates that joint. And um, I can actually go in and selectively numb that area. And I can go in and I can um, cauterize that little nerve ending. And that's a sensory portion of the, that sends a pain signal. And we can denervate that pain signal. And literally, your pain can go away. I, I've done this uh, thousands of times. And I've done it with my dad. He did great. It lasted three and a half years. He was back on the golf course enjoying, enjoying the golf that he was not able to play prior to that. He was in his 80s and wanted to really play around or two of golf and get away from mom for a few hours. But that being said, um, here is a depiction of a facet injection. Here the needle tip is entering into the facet space. Here is a picture of dye going into that facet. So it has an ovoid shape and you can see that dye material going along the outside of that joint. In this area right here, we see a needle going to the medial branch nerve. Uh, this nerve, as you see, has little nerve rootlets that innervate the joint, and um, also the nerve drops down to innervate the joint below. So in order to denervate one joint, you have to ablate two different nerve roots because you have to get the nerves that are dropping nerve uh, fibers down to that joint as well. Uh, here is a depiction of an ablation. Uh, the needle has, it's an insulated needle except for the very tip, about anywhere from five to 10 millimeters. Uh, there is a special catheter that heats up in the inside of that area and just the very tip of that needle heats up. It's placed under fluoroscopic guidance where I can actually see where that needle is being placed. We stimulate that needle with a sensory and motor stimulation at certain hertz level and that actually will cause little multifidus muscle contraction. So we know physiologically we're in the space. We see the, um, the x-ray so we know it's anatomically in the space and then we, we put anesthetic around that area and cauterize that little nerve root with. Once the anesthetic is in that area because it's a, such a small area that we burn, you really don't feel that and it really is less uncomfortable than actually getting an intraarticular injection. It takes uh, only a few minutes to do in the office so it's a, a great way to uh, get good relief for a long period of time and on average I would say anywhere from two to three years um, and it can be repeated over time. Now, there, uh, down below the uh, facet joints or is the sacroiliac joint. That's the junction between the sacrum and the iliac bone. And you can see a depiction of that right here. Here you have the needle entering into the space between the sacrum, which is the, right below the syringe, and the iliac bone, which is the top of your hip bone. Um, and that joint is uh, very commonly injured um, and also develops arthritis. It's, I think it's a little more common in women than guys, uh, when, uh, if, especially if women have had uh, babies before. Uh, during pregnancy, they release a hormone called relaxin. It actually loosens up that hip to allow the, the baby's head to pass through the pelvic area. And so that joint never really securely uh, adheres again. And then so there's increased motion segment of that hip. And over time, that SI joint becomes, can develop into an arthritic condition. And uh, generally, the, uh, there are, it's tough to diagnose this problem uh, because uh, you really have to put a lot of pressure on that area. It's commonly misdiagnosed and it's common 
I would say in terms of facet pain and SI joint pain, I would say one third of patients who present with lower back, buttock pain and hip pain, one third of patients, I think it's due to facet etiology. One third of patients have SI joint etiology or cause of the pain. And I would say one third have a little bit of both. So if you have arthritis in the joints, you probably have a little bit in the SI joint as well. And sometimes we need to treat both things concurrently. Um, usually associated with piriformis muscle spasm. It can contribute to a sciatic feeling down the back of the leg. So some babies like, I got a sciatic, but it's, it's not. It's just a referral pain from that joint. And usually it does follow uh, the sciatic distribution. Uh, rarely though, does it go past the knee. Uh, again, it's common in pregnancy, as I said, because of that hormone. Uh, there's treatment for it, anti-inflammatories, correcting leg length discrepancies, because people have differences in leg lengths. And just by adding a little heel lift, can take a lot of that abnormal motion away. Uh, we can do ablations of that, of the nerves around that joint that can eliminate that joint pain. And it can, again, can last for an extended period of time, years. Uh, and is another way to treat that condition as well. Uh, intraarticular injections are a good way to both diagnose and treat it at, in, com in combination with therapy, uh, especially if it's really inflamed. It's key to make that diagnosis. So the anesthetic block of these joints is key in determining where the pain is coming from. And that's the most important thing, is for us to determine where the problem emanates from so we can actually treat the problem. If you're just generally treating things and not getting down to the nitty gritty of where that pain is emanating from, it makes it difficult to get good outcomes. Um, so that's my slides, sorry. If you, anybody, you're gonna have to wake up now. Hello. <laughs> You can ask some questions. I'd be more than happy to uh, entertain. Well, it depends on the cause of the back pain. If you have facet pain, inversion tables it might help a little bit, not so much. If you have a disc herniation, uh, it's a form of traction. It's a gravity traction, so it can be helpful, especially if that disc, as it herniates, is kind of is hitting that nerve root. That helps decompress and put a little negative pressure in that disc. And that negative pressure is like a vacuum effect to that, that herniation. So there may be some uh, benefit to doing that intermittently, allowing the pressure of the nerve to uh, be released, allow for recovery and, uh, and healing to some extent. Uh, so I, I'm an advocate of traction, uh, the tilt tables, if it helps. If you do it and it hurts, I wouldn't keep doing it. <laughs> you have to use common sense. And if you can't figure out what the problem is, there's there's people that might be able to help you, like me. <laughs> what types of stretching or exercises do you recommend for lower back pain? Well, I mean, it depends on what's causing your lower back pain, because depending on what uh, is causing the problem, you're gonna have specific exercises for that particular problem. So if you have SI joint pain, there are specific stretches and, and uh, exercises for the SI joint, for instance. If you have facet pain, there's more flexion-based exercises. If you have a disc problem, there's more extension-based exercises, traction, things like that. So depending on the problem, it is more indicative of what kind of exercises you get. And really, I would recommend consulting with someone who knows, uh, and that would be a physical therapist or chiropractor who's very in-depth in, in, in musculoskeletal medicine. Well, usually trigger points are muscle-related tension points. And trigger points occur with myofascial pain. So myofascial pain is muscle-related pain. And, and if a muscle spasms for a period of time, it's uh, not getting proper blood flow. So if a muscle's tight, the arterial blood flow will go in, but the venous blood flow is slowed down because of the compression, because the venous, the veins are pretty soft and pliable, and with any type of compression, they'll stop flowing. So you'll build up lactic acid, substance C, all these inflammatory substances that accumulate in the muscle. And the muscle becomes hyper irritable and we call it a trigger. And what is a trigger? Well, you flick the muscle, uh, Travell and Simmons came up with this. If you flick the muscle, it gets a trigger. It actually flickers, it spasms. And that's how that name came about as a trigger point. So muscle problems, muscles aren't the problem unless you have really bad postural positioning and things like that over long periods of time. Usually it's an underlying, it's something that lasts for a long period of time is usually an underlying pathology and could be related to arthritis developing in your neck. When the, art, the, the difference between the facet joint 
in your spine. There's facet joints from the base of your, or joints from the base of your skull to occiput all the way down to your sacrum. And these joints have feedback to the spine. Whereas your finger joint, similar kind of joint in terms of size, really doesn't have that feedback. So um, in order for us to sit straight, if you think about all those vertebral levels, every single one of those joints, every single one of those vertebral levels has four joints, superior and inferior articulating facets on both sides. That's well over a hundred different joints. And all those joints have to coordinate with each other in order for you just to sit straight. So it's a virtual miracle that we can sit straight without thinking about it. Because if I were to sit here and have to think about each joint, I'd be like sitting here the whole time. I wouldn't be able to sit straight because every time I thought about one joint being in position, the other joint would go out of position. So there's an auto system. It, it's built in. And the spinal cord is the processor of that uh, auto system. And when that joint becomes inflamed and sends an, an aberrant signal, it goes to the spinal cord. And your spinal cord sends a reaction to the muscles that support that structure, that coordinate the position of that structure, start to spasm. And those spasms across those areas cause poor blood flow to those muscles, and those muscles become sore. And one muscle group gets sore, it kind of spreads to the other muscle groups because of the tension. There are layers, there's fascial planes of the muscles. And each fascial plane has its own innervation and vascular components. And when you have a group of muscles that are tightened up abnormal, abnormally in one map, myofascial plane, it spreads throughout that fascial plane in di different areas. So you might get a trigger point in the infraspinatus, the levator scapulae, the rhomboid muscles. So all these muscles in the back can get lit up from one thing, and that could be a facet joint problem or a discogenic problem or, or a neurogenic problem from a disc herniation. So there's a lot of different things going on there. It's, it's, very, it's kind of a complicated network that we have some basic understanding of and we're, you know, as the years go on and, and working for 25 years, our understanding and our ability, our capabilities in terms of diagnosing these problems have improved tremendously and really to the benefit of patients because we can really dramatically change people's um, outcomes and functional uh, activity levels, which is key. That's what we want to do, we'll make you feel better and do the things you like to do. That's, that, that's a success story for any patients that I have. So it looks like you have a lot more questions, but we're kind of out of time. But it's very nice meeting you all, and um, I'm available for a visit. If anybody has any issues they want to talk about, I'm more than happy to take, take a look and see and help you out. Um, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what is it? What's our schedule at se-ortho.com. Okay, you have to go to schedule at se-ortho.com. Uh, okay, so to make an appointment, you need to do that. But thanks again, and thanks. I really appreciate everybody listening. And I'm starved. I want to get home and get some to eat. Have a great evening. <laughs>